Thank you for your time today, Dr. Jabala. Let's get straight into the virus. So how much do we know about this COVID-19 virus? Uh, we know that it's the same member of a larger family of these viruses known as coronaviruses. Uh, they actually exist everywhere. They spend a lot of their time with animals. So this is a third virus that has crossed. So we have SARS-1, MERS, and now SARS-2. We are beginning a completely uncharted journey with this virus. We don't understand a lot because the behavior is completely different. Uh, I was very surprised at the outbreak in China. The numbers of people that were infected in such a relatively small period of time. Uh, it's very unusual. There are so many talk out there but it's not following the same rules as the other viruses. Uh, this virus is much more aggressive and much more lethal. And for every virus, there is a certain level of lethality. There is a lethal dose. There is how much of this virus you need to have in your lungs before it kills you or before it makes you sick. With this virus, it's not very clear. It's actually very uh, disturbing. There have been some interesting reports that they've had people who were sick and they were cured, they released them out of the hospital, and then they got reinfected. The truth is very simple. The assays that we do every day to test this virus, they can only test a certain limit. And if the virus level goes below that threshold, you're not going to detect it, meaning you're going to release the patient and say you're healthy enough to leave. What I find alarming is we are releasing all these patients, telling them they are virus-free and they go back to the community. It's not your average SARS, it's not your average MERS. Uh, uh, many people, including me, we start calling it a very mysterious, very cryptic virus because we don't understand it and it doesn't seem to only attack the lungs, it seems to also attack the heart and it seems also to attack the liver. So we're seeing interesting patterns, not only old people or those with underlying health conditions actually develop this disease. Now, the elderly are really the first category that get affected a lot because as we get older, our immune system declines. Between the elderly and the adolescent to probably 56 years old, their lifestyles will dictate how vulnerable they are to a virus. Uh, what I have observed, which is uh, very different to the MERS, is the rate of, of infection of young is lower. It, it doesn't mean that we don't have to close schools or we can let our kids outside play. It means that for now, these are the trends that we are observing. There are so many unknowns about this COVID-19 and China, the Chinese government is responsible for this lack of information. Do you think this is actually becoming an obstacle for um, developing a vaccine sooner? China is not forthcoming with a lot of this information. This, this, this information is coming in different bits and pieces. And I think there are some fantastic people around the world that are spending time dissecting that information and putting it together. It's not so much for developing vaccine, but to study the trajectory of where this virus is going. Right now we're in the middle of a storm and a vaccine is not going to help. Even if we have a vaccine today, uh, it's not going to help. I think people don't realize that vaccines don't work for every individual that gets the vaccine. Vaccine is a preventative thing. Vaccine is really helping your immune system to kickstart. Your, your, your immune system is really what protecting you. The vaccine is, is just helping, pointing to the immune system where to go. The information that we're lacking from China is about one individual, patient zero. The case in Italy, the cases in Iran, we have few cases in the United States, especially on the west coast of America, where we can't link that fingerprint to the virus from Wuhan. So without that information of that patient zero in Wuhan, uh, it's really, we are in a bad situation to understand where this virus is going. Uh, so that, that, that information would be really critical for us to understand the evolution of this virus. And that would really help us 
stop the spread, not to treat the virus, really stop the spread. So you're saying that the patient zero is the key to understand the nature of this virus and contain patient, this virus? So, yes, patient zero is really critical to tell us what were this, uh, what we call advantageous mutations that happened from the animal kingdom to the human. The one time it can infect us, that's the transition. It means now this virus figured out that the virus has the key now to borrow, not just to borrow our engine, to borrow the whole body as an engine for the virus to spread. The only way to keep it at bay, if you have a very good vaccine that makes antibodies that's going to neutralize the virus and clear it, that's wonderful. But for 20 years, many companies, many researchers have promised us a virus for SARS version 1. And we are in 2020 and this vaccine doesn't exist. Many reasons. One is there is no more threat, so everybody forgets about it. Two, they have tried and they have identified difficulties that these viruses are not amenable to a vaccine. And because of that, they may need several years of research. The best comparison to that is the Ebola virus in Africa. The only reason we got a vaccine for Ebola is because Ebola decided to leave the continent of Africa and start infecting people in Europe and in America. So those people start getting worried about an Ebola spread on their own soil. And that was the push for government funding to get those vaccines done. Companies will not make vaccines if there is no one to buy it. They only make it when the government is under crisis. So the government can write the check and sign the check and hand over the money. But those governments have not seen a vaccine yet for SARS. And there hasn't been a push for it. Now, perhaps, they will try something, but I am not holding my breath. We are seeing a rapid spread of this virus, and the WHO declare that this virus is, the spread of this virus is a pandemic. Why is this virus traveling so quickly around the world? So this virus is, is traveling with new friends called bacteria. These bacteria love to live in confined environment like an airplane. They live on the hard surfaces, they live on the soft surfaces. We, as an unaware patients, we're going to sit on that seat on the plane, we're going to touch everything, we're going to read the magazine that 200 people read it before, and each time somebody touches the magazine, we leave some bacteria in there. And as soon as those people land in Italy, as an example, and get out of the airport, now they're going to spread this thing everywhere. But as soon as you get into a patient who are in the higher category of age, and have underlying diseases, you start the factory. But the virus that woke up in Italy is much more aggressive than the one who left the plane from China. Mutations. So when it woke up, it mutated again, and now it's much more aggressive than the, what's going on in Italy today. We can plot it on an exponential curve. It's scary. Korea, the only equivalent is the church. I think the Korean government and the Korean people should be grateful for this church. Because this church provided us the first data of this very, very directional spread. And I think what that church did is really forced uh, the Moon government, they forced their hands to go out now and throw away all the definitions of who to test for and what to look for and say, we're going to look for everybody. Foreign media has been reporting that you can go out without a mask. It's actually not recommended to wear a mask. What do you think about this? The, the mask really uh, provides two things. The psychology of wearing a mask, so you are less likely to touch your nose and your mouth and your eyes, and also not for you to give it to other people, it's what other people give you. And because people will give you things that you're not aware of, 
those those things can land on your clothes, on your bag, on your cell phone, but you're wearing a mask. Even if you touch those things, uh, the the rate of infection is very low. So the risks by having a mask is very low. I was actually alarmed that everyone has a different story. I think uh, in the United States, the CDC position was very clear because they are afraid of shortages down the road. If they, as an example, the, sh the church followers were all wearing masks, we wouldn't see five, six thousand cases. In Italy, they don't wear masks. You saw where the numbers are. And I think that's where the mask plays this uh, uh, protective element, both psychologically and actually when you leave your home, which is your controlled environment, into the public uh, environment outside that you can't control. You're part of it. To curb the COVID-19 outbreak, um, the CDC suggested some non-pharmaceutical interventions like taking care of personal hygiene uh, that people and communities should be doing to um, slow the spread of the virus. So what do you think at this point we should do to prevent the spread of this virus? I think now we understand how the virus is moving and the containment is at 90%. So an average Korean is at 10% risk of getting infected. I think at the 10% risk of getting infected, a lot of Koreans will become complacent. I think the Korean CDC is absolutely correct. The way this virus behaved in the church, uh, it's really behaving almost like a bacteria. It's like a non-hospital acquired bacterial infections. And the only remedy for that is hygiene. I think in the next month or two months, uh, the, the weather will change in Korea. It means the Koreans are very outdoor people. They love hiking. They love doing all sorts of sports. And I think that's where we're going to see more of this natural interaction of people that would be very hard to control because they're not crowds. So keeping on the message by the Moon administration for hygiene, uh, Korea is very good at disinfection. If, if they maintain this on course, uh, I think the number of cases will start going down, whether they got rid of the virus completely or not. And I think this way, at least, uh, uh, you know, peace and quiet will come to Korea and, and put this uh, bad episode of uh, SARS version 2 behind them and really look forward to re-establishing some of the damage, especially the economical damage, uh, uh, that was done to, to the country. So what kind of efforts should we make to prevent the spread of more deadly viruses like COVID-19 in the future? Uh, a very good question. I think it's, uh, it goes down to two critical aspects. One is preparedness. That each time uh, a patient shows up in emergency with symptoms that no one has seen before, immediately they should be reported across all the healthcare institutions. This is the, this is the biggest mistake for MERS. If patient zero, when he showed up at Samsung, was isolated, we're done. Uh, I think uh, Korea has not really embraced this concept of monitoring. Uh, for some people, they think it's Big Brother spying on you. Uh, in 2015, I actually criticized Korean CDC and basically called them lazy, sitting in their offices, and the only thing they do is shove paperwork. Until MERS came and they found themselves really incompetent to, to, to actually handle it. Uh, some of the recommendations that came from the National Assembly speak to that. And I think now the Korean CDC have been challenged twice now. So there shouldn't be a third time. And I think this monitoring should be already in place, not just to protect humans, but actually to protect the livestock in Korea. Uh, with regard, with respect to the Korean pharmaceutical companies, uh, uh, when I came to Korea, I was actually amazed at the infrastructure that these companies have, but I was disappointed at how many times the Korean government bailed them out using taxpayers' money. There are some good companies that have a track record in making vaccines like Green Cross. Uh, there is no reason why Green Cross 
uh, is not trying hard to make these vaccines. The Green Cross was one of the companies that got some funding during the first crisis to make a vaccine, and they actually did not happen. So in Korea, it's, it's different to other countries because those companies are surviving because the government has helped them survive. So they're not really producing anything yet. Uh, but because each time you give them money to do something, and then the problem disappears, and no one holds them accountable for that, we, we don't have a vaccine today. So I think monitoring as part of preparedness uh, is very, very critical. I think that would really help uh, the uh, emergency protocols to be activated. It means we start monitoring the borders. And if we know that this threat is coming from a specific country, we shut the border. I think that would make Korea much, much safer.